Hello, everyone. I am not Nee Fitzpatrick. My apologies. <laughs> um, it's my, my real pleasure to be here tonight to um, uh, support Liz Gleeson and the Shapes of Grief podcast and her grief education program. Uh, Liz is, as you all know, she's, she's just such a good person. Um, and she's a rare person, and that is a powerful mix. Uh, so the first, part, the first piece that I'm going to read tonight is actually one that I wrote for uh, a different grief project called the Good Grief Project. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of them, but um, there's a dynamic husband and wife team called uh, Jane Harris and Jimmy Edwards, who are also friends of Liz's. And um, they do great work making films and running retreats uh, to help people with their grief, uh, all inspired by the sudden death of their own son, Josh. So yeah, they asked me to write a piece about grief and I wrote this, uh, when did I write this? Kind of in the middle of COVID. Um, they just said, the brief really was just tell us about your grief. And so this is what I wrote. <laughs> when I miss my brother John in the mornings, I eat marmalade toast. It makes me feel better. John loved marmalade. He was a proper, mindful Paddington bear. In 2019, age 46, within a year and a half of his diagnosis, John died of a fast-growing, aggressive brain tumour. Two years before that, in 2017, my husband Simon died from motor neuron disease at the age of 43. He lived with MND for nine years and could not move or breathe for most of it. These are the facts as they happened. The above litany of lost gives me every reason to look for sympathy, remain broken and miserable, or feel robbed and landed with a raw deal. What have I told you? I feel lucky and blessed. Not that they died, but for the lessons so much loss has gifted me. You might wonder if I am a Jesus freak, or a kook, or a liar, or trying to, to promote some kind of new fad yoga practice or energy drink tell me to get lost. I might do the same had I not been through it myself. I am less cynical. I am lucky. When we drive by the ocean and streaks of sunlight spill through the clouds in every direction, I call them God's fingers and shout, look, to my five children. Dada is saying hello. We hug trees when they miss him because he loved forests. We eat Jaffa cakes on his birthday and they beg me to tell them again and again how he could eat a whole pack at a time without stopping. His legacy lingers in the fabric of our daily lives, in the particular way my son bites his tongue when concentrating, or the blue shape of my daughter's eyes, in our unhealthy love of Jaffa cakes. Why am I lucky? Because loss woke me up to the fact I am alive at all. For months after he died, my husband lived in our floor-to-ceiling bookshelves he had loved and built in our kitchen. Here, I could talk to him directly, between remembered poems, scraps of paper and spidering handwriting scrawled in book margins. Most days I would say, Simon, give me something, then glean the book spines and choose one jutting out further than the rest. Often we still talk to each other this way. Simon lived with M&D for almost a decade, he was a powerful flame extinguished by degrees, by ventilators, by round-the-clock nurses, eye gaze technology and a computerised voice. This prolonged loss was too much and it brought me to nature. I took up sea swimming and plunged myself year-round in the freezing Irish Sea, ridding my mind of the painful chatter. Sea swimming lifted the daily sadness from my bones. I emerged every day lighter, a clean slate, until the very next day, sadness weighed me down again. You can embrace the seasons, make your peace with the life-death life cycle, grapple with acceptance, but to experience such active loss is debilitating. The body experiences trauma and it doesn't forget. Grief takes you down and immobilizes you. It leaves you with very large visible holes. What is needed then is a full keening, a wailing, a gnashing of teeth, an existential scream that shakes the world. 
This is what is supposed to happen if you have ever loved at all. Swimming stopped the grief chatter. It emptied my head as I begged the cold ocean for that elusive thing called ease and long forgotten silences. With a clear head, that's when it happened. Among the waves, along the shore, between treasure pockets of glinting sea glass, flocks of birds swooping overhead and glimpses of the fleeting sunrise, I heard the beautiful sounds and rhythms of nature. It was nothing less than the music of my own soul. Grief was a rude awakening. It woke me to the fact I have a soul at all. A soul is harder to ignore when it is screaming. There is nothing pleasant about it, but you gain a new alertness. A soul in pain is a soul that has woken up. It is not for the faint-hearted. I discovered that my heart is huge and my love infinite. It stirred up my creative energy because I had no choice but to write my way out of this. I wrote like a maniac and realized my words had a beat to them too, much like a song. The soul is our own inner landscape and its natural rhythms are musical and breathtaking as the biggest view. I am my words and my soul is me. I swam and wrote about it and the book took on a life of its own. People listened and could relate. This brought enormous comfort and my song got stronger. A whole orchestra swelled. What is grief? Only the small matter of finding your soul's song and connecting to others. Only the most intense human experience we can have. In my own small blip of existence, I have learned more about life through walking with death than anything else. Now each day, I make a promise to my dear departed brother and husband. Life is a precious gift. I promise them I will try to live well. I thank them for the lessons and tell them I miss them. Sometimes I cry, often I swim. None of us will live forever. I hug my children tighter, eat marmalade toast and the odd Jaffa cake, talk to my bookshelf, read poetry, attempt yoga poses, sample the latest energy drink, continue to create, laugh and sing. In this beautiful life, I walk on with love. That's the first one, and I'm going to have to have a drink of water. <laughs> wow, this is intense. It's a bit like some kind of confessional. Uh, so the next one that I'm going to read is um, from my book, I, I Found My Tribe, which was published in 2017, which was also the year that Simon died um, from motor neuron disease. Um, now, Liz asked me to read this chapter. I've never actually re read this chapter <laughs> before um, at a reading because it's really about a bad mood, and, and, and I do apologise, it's got lots of bad language in it. It's the thing about when you're um, in survival mode and in grief, um, you curse like a sailor. So <laughs> that's the mood I was in when I wrote this chapter. Um, um, so this is based... Um, Simon was diagnosed with MND in 2008. By 2010, uh, he was in a wheelchair, but he still had uh, use of his upper body. And we had escaped to Australia. I had brought, I had dragged him and uh, our three little boys over to Australia to hang out with friends. So uh, this chapter was written, is about when we came home from Australia back to Ireland and things were starting to get very real. Um, I had been a superhero when we were in Australia. Uh, kind of a superhero wife slash carer, amazing partner. And um, uh, when we moved back to Greystone, Simon was beginning to deteriorate a lot more and he was losing a lot more strength. And so it was getting harder to be that superhero slash carer, amazing wife. <clears throat> so it's called Kicking Cars. And again, I apologize for the language. <clears throat> See this. <clears throat> what do you do on dark days? MND is like water torture, slowly drip, drip, dripping, a tiny nerve ending, a small piece of strength gets stolen every single day. When superheroes lose their powers, it never ends well. They get dramatically destroyed. I imagine exploding in company. I could self-combust at the supermarket in a fine, sticky mess. 
over mild chats about all the rain we've been having? Why can't I wake up those nerve endings, shake them back to life, slap them in the face? Home from Perth, I get so angry. Make it stop, why can't you make it stop? Stay with us, we love you, we need you, we don't want to be here without you. Then I cry from a very dark place and fall deep. Back in Greystones, there is so much rain. It's hard being back where we were f lived first married. That life was all cliff walks, coffees and casual strolls. This place is confusing and cross. I wish that Dada could walk like other Dadas. Jack, my son, wails at four years of age. I want to cry forever. Then he makes a good stab at it. I know this cry so well. It's from the deepest place. It stirs you up so you think your insides will spill out. It's a disgusting, physical mess of a cry that retches out the darkest parts. It's not fair, he cries, and I know it's not. To see my boy cry like this makes me angry. But not just, not just one boy. Two tinier hearts weep and roar in the wings, his loyal backup singers. They understand even less, but know for sure that it's shit. What do you do? You want your head to blow up in bright sparks because that is what it feels should happen. You can't curl into a ball in a dark room because children are crying with empty cups. They are fighting for toast. It has to be you because there's nobody else to do it. And without a superhero suit, you think, what is the point? An angry brain screams fast, angry thoughts. There is no hope for these beautiful boys. They will end up in rehab or drug addicts or on mystery milk cartons because their mother got shouting mad and their father stared at walls from his wheelchair and then he died. Is this where we're going because there's nowhere else to go? His arms will stop working and he won't be able to talk. I will want to die myself because it's too large to bear the weight of it. We will have orphan Oliver Twist children. Oh please sir, I want no more. We drive a comical wheelchair car. It's Postman Pat's van painted blue. I drive slowly so Simon doesn't get hurt by the bumps. He sits high in the back while his three boys fight and chat in the middle. We all jump at the howl of a, of a car horn. A low green convertible cuts me off at a T-junction. It's just another road rage driver beeping us in traffic. We meet them every day, but today something breaks. The green beast stops at a red light up ahead and I pull up behind him. My body goes calm. Back in a second, I bark at the boys. What do you do with the pain when you're world weary and really angry at the same time? I have banged my head against walls. It bled and I saw stars. I have stared at my scrawny arms and imagined red gashes slashing blue veins. I have crumpled to the floor, hiding behind kitchen presses, hugging my knees for dear life. I have drunk and smoked, overeaten, undereaten, all the foods, both good and bad. I have fought shallow breaths till my lungs burst, gasped till I'm numb, laughed till I cried and cried manic laughing tears. I march up to the driver's window and a middle-aged man glances out. I was driving slowly because my husband is in a wheelchair, I shout. Maybe you didn't see the big wheelchair sticker? He waves me away and puts up the window. You're a very rude man, I shout more loudly this time. He won't look at me and I decide to kick the shit out of his car. <laughs> <laughs> I keep kicking and kicking until the light goes green and he speeds off again. I am breathing heavily but feel amazingly calm. <laughs> An onlooker on the footpath waves, cheers and gives me the thumbs up. <laughs> Angry tears have drowned me in dark pits. Buried in fits of black panic, there is no starry sky. I have picked my nails raw and bitten my hand so hard it broke skin, leaving toothy scar smiles. I have done all this, and yet I am still here. I have never fully broken. Our dark world now fills me with the urge to break stuff. I want to break everything and just smash this shit up. <laughs> Returning to our postman Pat van, I click quietly into my seatbelt. The boys sit up with open mouths. Mama, what did you do that for? S asks Jack. Sorry, love, I reply. That man was just a fucking asshole. <laughs> I still feel calm, but my hands are shaking so badly I can barely turn the ignition. You said the F word, Jack says in delight. Yep, your mama most definitely said the F word, says Simon, and we laugh as the ignition key finally turns. The engine revs 
a mighty postman Pat roar. Momentarily, this destroyed superhero feels remarkably fine. <laughs> One more water. I need a breather between those anyway, so I'll just sip some water. Whew. Okay, last one. So this last piece uh, I wrote this morning after the school run. Um, and after I got a panicked phone call from Liz saying, oh my God, Neve Fitzpatrick is sick um, and that she had to cancel and could I speak? And um, I just said, oh God, Liz, but I'll have to get a blow dry. <laughs> that stayed me. So Liz very kindly um, booked the hairdressers for me. And so here I am um, with far better hair than I had this morning. So thank you, Liz. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to help Liz because uh, Liz was a, a wonderful help to me back when Simon died and one of my boys particularly completely just switched off from grief and uh, she recommended a, a, a play therapist who quite literally switched him back on again and now he is um, a, a happy boy full of light and so I'm eternally grateful so I would probably walk over hot coals for Liz or certainly do anything for her last minute. Um, <laughs> um, so what is this about? Yeah, so I wrote this this morning and it's actually about a, a, a coffee I had with a friend yesterday, which was my birthday. And um, uh, I, I, it, it was just sort of like, it's very short, but it's just teasing out some feelings that I had um, yesterday. Um, obviously, Neve Fitzpatrick is a, a qualified psychologist um, and I'm not. Uh, so instead you get my kind of pseudo psychological ramblings or or just my um you know thinking th thoughts on feelings just put into words so um this is what i wrote oh it's called life hack did i say that yeah here we go <clears throat> a good friend of mine whose wife died in january this january said a funny thing to me yesterday over coffee Talking with you like this is my own personal life hack on how to manage the grief process, he said. Now, I don't know if there are any life hacks for grief or that grief is something to be managed. Management suggests we are in control of anything at all when grief, I have found, is a curious process of letting go. And who the hell wants to be a grief expert? Uh, not me. I don't know if anyone sets out to be that. Uh, often the process of living has different plans for us than the ones we expect. I do know that when my friend and I sit together over coffee, wishing it was wine, uh, there is a knowingness that passes between us, a relief on both sides that the other person understands. Uh, to sit in that space of understanding creates unexpected healing. Healing of the unexpected kind, in my experience, is the most magical of all. The sheer surprise gift of it gives you hope. So who between us is really getting the life hack? Him, the one new to this, recently bereaved, still reeling, left blinking in the harsh sunlight, or me, the weary seasoned traveler, the one accustomed to facing the sun? The truth is, of course, as we talked about everything and nothing, invisible threads passed between us, and for a tiny moment, it all made sense. I understood everything, life, death, the universe. Then, just as quickly, I forgot. Life remains a mystery as layer after layer, two slightly broken, grieving, impermanent humans, neither devils nor angels, both just alive and inherently flawed, continue to grow, unravel some more, and learn by letting go. Maybe the next time we talk, we'll both remember again. Sitting in that knowingness, so very glad that another human understands. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.